Our God is a covenant-keeping God. But also, our God initiates covenants. And we all know that a covenant is an agreement, but when we look at it in the biblical language, a covenant is actually a container. A container of blessings and promises that God obligates himself to keep. Now, when we look at that word covenant in Hebrew, it is derived from a verb, as all Hebrew nouns are, that has to do with purity. So God establishes a covenant with a people in order to purify them. And there's a purpose for that. Because that word purity in the Bible is closely related to blessing. God initiates a covenant to purify us in order that God, he may bless us. Now, we're going to look at this first session at the foundational covenant. And I'm speaking about what is recorded in Genesis chapter 12, known as the Abrahamic covenant. And that Abrahamic covenant is also called, prophetically, a covenant of peace. And that word peace relates to the fulfillment of God's will. It is also known as Brit Olam. We might translate that as an eternal covenant. But this word eternal is an adjective that describes the kingdom of God. So the Abrahamic covenant it is a kingdom covenant that is going to bring about the fulfillment of God's purposes, his plans, his will in your life and throughout his creation. Take out your Bible and look with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis and chapter 12. Now, in speaking about this Abrahamic covenant, we learn from the apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16, that the foundation of that Abrahamic covenant is known as the seed of Abraham, who is indeed the Messiah. When we look at Messiah's teaching, for example, on the night that he was betrayed, when he gathered with his disciples, he spoke about the fact that he was going to be betrayed that he was going to be crucified, and that his blood, which would be shed, would establish the new covenant. And again, that word new relates to the kingdom of God. And here's what I want to share with you in this first session. There is something foundational, something that is still very important to God in order that that kingdom, that kingdom Agreement might be fulfilled. And it's something that much of Christianity ignores or simply thinks is no longer relevant. Look with me, as I said, to Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, we read here in verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Avram. Not Avraham, but this was before this change took place. And a change in name speaks about a change of identity, a change of character, and we're going to see what brought about such a change. And let me pause for a moment and share with you, and many of you I know, some of you I do not know, but I can say this about everyone. God wants to bring change in your life. We can say it differently. There are things in your life, and I know this is true because there are things in my life that God's not pleased with. God wants to get rid of. These things are hindering you and him from being the person that God has created you to become and has redeemed you to be. So changes are what God does. Look at verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Avram. Now, this verb for speaking relates to revelation. God almost always wants to give his people revelation. We can say that differently. God wants to give us truth. 
He wants to instruct us with his word in order to bring about his change in our life. And we're going to see that Abraham goes through quite a change. Verse 1, and the Lord spoke to Abram, and this is where it gets interesting. Now, this is Shabbat. In every synagogue throughout the world today, there is a Torah portion. That means a passage from the Torah, which is studied. And when we look at Genesis 12, we call that Torah portion of this passage Lech Lecha. And that's the next phrase that appears here. And it's usually not translated literally as it should be. Because it means go. Then after that, you. The order is significant because the emphasis is not on you, but on you going. It is a word of instruction that, that told Avram that he needed to go and everything that God wanted to do was dependent upon Avram doing just that, going, making a change in location. And notice what he says, go you from your land. First thing that's mentioned, you need to change your location. You need to go away from your land. Now, that can also be understood as your country. Speaking about what was familiar to him. What was understood to him. And then secondly, we see another word which has to do with your birthplace. Most of the scholars understand this as heritage. So get away from your culture. Get away from your heritage. And also, he says, from the house of your father. And again, the rabbinical scholars, they speak about the house of one's father as a reference to security. In other words, what God is saying is this. Everything that gives you comfort, everything that's familiar, and we like those things that are familiar. Come, change, for most of us, come very difficult. We like to be what we always have been. God wants to make us into something new, and by and large, you and I, we resist that. And this is what God is challenging Avram. To move away from his country, from those things that are, are part of his heritage, and those things that bring security into his life. And notice what it says, last part of verse 1, to the land, and by the way, in the Hebrew language, that phrase, to the land, is emphasized. Here's what most people fail to understand. When we deal with the Abrahamic covenant, that covenant which is inherently, according to Paul, remember that verse, Galatians 3.16, that Abrahamic covenant which Messiah is the foundation of, that kingdom covenant, the covenant we're interested in, that Messiah died so that we could experience, first and foremost, it is dependent upon the land, and not just any land, the promised land. The land, and you need to remember this word, because we're going to encounter it later on, and this is the land of Canaan. Now, you should not be unfamiliar with the meaning of that word Canaan. If you are a serious Bible student, and you ought to be, because a serious Bible student is what's known as a faithful disciple. And the word, every word and every name, every place in the Bible, it has a message to it. There is a meaning in names. And the term Canaan or Canaan in Hebrew has to do with submissiveness. The Canaanites, they were called to submit. And it's not unique for them. Everyone God speaks to, 
Everyone that God gives revelation to, everyone who encounters God's instruction, that instruction, that truth is given to us in order that we might submit, learn a principle. Nothing good from God's standpoint and his standpoint is the only one that matters, correct? Nothing good is going to happen in your life spiritually, something that has true significance. Nothing good is going to happen until you and I approach God submissively. That's the only way that we can draw near to God. See, the Hebrew word for worship relates to drawing near to Him. And you cannot approach God. You cannot experience God. You cannot benefit from God until you approach Him submissively. So the land, that promised land that we may call Israel today, it was known, the land of Canaan, the land of submissiveness. And we see that it's a promised land, but you can't have access. You can't receive those promises until you approach God submissively. So he says here, end of verse 1, to the land which I will show you. Now, Avram doesn't know what land God is referring to. God says, to the land, that's emphasized, to the land, I will show you. Now, if you're like me, I like to know things in advance. We have a mutual friend, and he says, will you do me a favor? Well, what do I say? What do you want? What is that favor that you're asking? I don't want to agree to something until I know the terms. God doesn't work that way. God calls us to submit because who it is that's asking us to submit. It's because he is the Lord that we should always desire to submit to whatever he instructs us. So he says here, to the land that I will show you. Now, Avraham, in the Bible, what stands out about him is his faithfulness. Now, let me ask you, don't answer out loud, but are you faithful? Now, most of us would say, well, I like to be more faithful. Well, I can tell you, how you can become more faithful to God. Study his promises. What caused Avraham to approach God faithfully is that he emphasized the promises of God. And that's what we see in the next verse. God says, I want you to go to this land. I'm going to show it to you. You need to respond now by getting away from your country from your heritage, from that which gives you security, your father's house. And if you do so, this is what you can expect. And he makes promises. Look at verse 2. God cannot lie, and he says, I will make you into Goy Gadol. Now, that means if we want to translate it literally, we could say, I will make you into a great Gentile. And we said, we're talking about Avraham. Well, in this case, Avraham is not Jewish. He was not born being a Jew. In fact, everyone will tell you that Avraham is the first Jew. And the only reason that he became Jewish is because of this covenantal relationship. You see, the word Jew comes from a Hebrew word, which means to offer praise. It is a word that is related to worship. And we're going to see that foundational to that Abrahamic covenant is a call to worship. Abraham, because of this covenant, is going to begin to do something that no one has truly ever done like Avraham, and that is to worship God. God. So he says, I will make you into, and most Bibles will say, a great nation. That word goy is surprising. 
Because in modern Hebrew, it's always thought of the word goy as a non-Jewish person. So we look at this and we say, really? A great goy? But prophetically, that word appears. So many of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they use this term prophetically about Israel in the last days. Why? Because God keeps covenant. He makes them, but he keeps them. And whenever Israel prophetically is called a goy in the prophets, God is working to bring this about. And let me be very clear about something. This covenant is going to be fulfilled. And all humanity should be glad by that because of what God promises. Look again at verse 2. I will make you a great nation. And here's the foundation of this, this covenant. He says, I will bless you. That's what God desires to do. It doesn't matter what color skin you are. It doesn't matter what language, what culture you're from. God looks at humanity. Humanity is tied to God because God created all people. And God wants to bless all people. But in order to be blessed, you have to be part of a covenant. And not just any covenant, but this Abrahamic covenant. And let me ask you again. Who's the foundation of this covenant? Paul tells us it is Yeshua. It is the Lord over all Jesus of Nazareth. So he says here, I will bless you. And notice something else. I will make your name great. Now again, when we look at that expression to have a great name, the sages of Judaism sees that as an expression, as an idiom that speaks of significance. I will make your name great. I'm going to give your life significance. See, here's the problem. Most people in this world, because they reject the gospel, they are not within the covenantal family of God. They are living a life of insignificance. It is only through following the instructions of God, pursuing, and this is what made Abraham unique. Abraham went after the promises of God. That's what faith is. Faithfulness is when I pursue God's promises. And it's only in that type of change that God brings into a person's life where they pursue the promises of God, then and only then, Will their life have significance? He says, I will make your name great. And look at the end of verse 2. And you shall be a blessing. Now, I'm looking out. I know how many chairs were set up here. So looking out and seeing the empty seats, we can say that approximately right now in this group, there are, are 69 individuals. 69. And what God is saying is this. I am willing to give 68 of them 1 million euros. Just for an example. I'm willing to give each one 1 million euros. But to one of you, I'm willing to give 68 million euros. Which one would you rather be? Now be careful. Because the one that receives the 68, you know what he does with that? He gives one to each other person. So at the end, what does he have left? Nothing. He's the most blessed. Because he was used by God. We all know the verse. It's more blessed to what? Give. So when he says you will be a blessing, God says, I want to use Avraham and this nation in order to be a vessel, an instrument, whereby, and we'll see this in a moment, 
I bring blessing into this world. Upon who? Well, look at verse 3. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. And in you, meaning in that great nation that's coming, in you, all the families of the earth. That's pretty broad, is it not? Pretty inclusive. That's God's nature. God desires to bless every human being, but it's conditional. What's emphatic here is that phrase, vacha, which means in you. What do we know about that? There's no other way that, that a family can be blessed apart from you. Who's you? This nation that is going to come into being through Abraham's heritage, through that change that God's going to bring into this man. And what is foundational? Here's what we forget. This is what the church oftentimes ignores. The foundation of all of this is the land. And that's why the land of Israel is so controversial today. So controversial. The world, the European Union, the United States of America, all over, you look at any government, and they're all concerned about one thing. And what is that? Jewish people dwelling in the land. In fact, the world has a peace process, and that involves the Jewish people giving up land making what God has promised to be smaller. This is what's it about. God wants to bring blessing to who? All humanity, all nations, all races, all languages. But he says, if that's going to happen, then the nation that comes from Abraham and from Abraham to Yitzchak, Isaac, and from Isaac to Yaakov, Jacob. It is not all of Abraham's descendants. That's not biblical. This is what we hear all too often. When we think of the seed of Abraham, oh, it means all of Abraham's descendants. It does not. The seed of Abraham is Messiah. And only those who are in that new covenant relationship with him can find blessing. But that new covenant is still connected to the Abrahamic co covenant, which is related to the land. Now, not too long ago, I was asked to listen to, how many of you know of an organization called the Bible Project? Anyone has heard of that? They do, and for the most part, it's, it's good. But they do very short videos, usually uh, uh, drawn videos, right? Animation, where they give a summary of a biblical book. And what they do with a book, and by the way, it's prophetic. You love prophecy, don't you? You ought to. You ought to. Because the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Christ. That's what we're called to have. And if you don't love prophecy, you're not going to see the testimony, the witness of Messiah being manifested through you. In fact, the book of Revelation, it's addressed to servants, but the servants are the prophets. Those who are listening to God and implementing God's word into their life. That's one definition of a prophet. They heard from God and they responded to what they heard. Now, the prophet that is uniquely given to the nations, not to Israel, but to the nations, is the prophet known as Ovadia, or in English, Obadiah. He's the only prophet that his message was not primarily for Israel, but to the nations. Most of the church do not know this. And the Bible Project, they, they did a horrible, I'm apologizing for this, but it's true, a horrible job with Obadiah. 
because they take the word Edom. And they say Edom comes from the Hebrew word Adam, and this is all about humanity. No. Although there is a relationship between the word Adam and Edom, they're two different words. Edom is the modern Hebrew word for red. And we see that Esau, when we look at it, he loved something. What did he love? Kind of a, I think you all would say a porridge. Is that good? Porridge? A stew that was red in nature. And he loved it so much that his name and the people who would come from him would be called Edom or Edom in English. It's not a message about humanity. This is false. It's a message about one group of people who make decisions forsaking the covenant of God and the call of God for one meal to satisfy one's fleshly desires. And God says that he hates humanity. Is that what we find? No. The Bible doesn't say that. God says that he hates Edom. And the prophecy of Obadiah is not a prophecy as the Bible project will tell you about humanity. It's not. It's about God's judgment upon Edom because there's going to be, in the last days, a war. A war between primarily the sons of Esau, that's Edom, and the sons of Jacob, that's Israel. And then there's that transitional verse, and the Bible Project gets it right. They speak about that transitional verse, but they fail in something. They don't realize that what the book of Obadiah is about, if you look sometime at the last verse, verse 21, there's a great statement. And then the kingdom will be the Lord's. Isn't that what we want? What it means, it's an idiom, then God will establish his kingdom. I would like that to happen today. In fact, I would like it to happen yesterday. When God establishes his kingdom, that is a good, a very good thing. But here's the problem. The Bible project, here again, I'm not trying to, to put it down. It does excellent work. It's just in Obadiah, they didn't. Because when you read that transitional verse which they speak of, they ignore everything that's said after that. Because for the kingdom to be established, see, the question that you should ask yourself is this. What has to happen? For the, if, do you want the kingdom? Do you want the kingdom? Then you should say, what has to happen for the kingdom to come? We're taught to pray. Thy will be done, thy kingdom come so i should be interested in god's will because if god's will is not fulfilled i'm not going to experience the fullness of that kingdom and that kingdom is an outcome of the covenant and that covenant contains blessings and promises so this is important this is something that's going to cause you to worship god when you are in the kingdom and when you are in the presence of Almighty God, you're not going to have to ask, well, how should I worship? Worship's going to be a natural experience, a natural expression from being with God. And what Obadiah says is this. He tells us what has to happen, and it's very clear. You can read the last part of Obadiah. He says that Jewish people must dwell in certain locations in order for God to bring about the kingdom. It's just that simple. It's not a matter of interpretation. It is simple. Read it. There are certain places, places in Lebanon, places in Egypt, places in Jordan, the Jordan of today, Gilead, that's in Jordan where Jewish people must dwell 
in order for God to look at that, see that, and establish his kingdom. Let me ask you, do you see, for example, the United Nations saying, you know, we think it's a good thing that Jewish people spread out, not just in the borders of Israel today, they question those borders, but even beyond the borders of Israel today. Is that what we're hearing from any of the governments in the world? No, we're hearing the exact opposite. We must give up land. No, no, and no. Not if we're interested in the covenant of God. You read, and we're going to see in this passage, land is emphasized. Look now to verse 4. It says here that Avraham went, and I love this next part, the word kasher, which means just as. Now, remember that, because there's going to be another verb that we're going to encounter later on in this session that is going to reflect this word, just as. And your Bible is going to do, because I've checked out 30-some translations, your Bible is going to do a horrible job translating it. Because instead of looking and studying what is this word literally meaning, they say, what makes sense to me? Never do that. Never approach God's word by saying, what makes sense? You'll miss it every time. Why? Because my thoughts are not whose thoughts? His thoughts. Never, never, ever. The only time that I can think like God is when I am functioning with the mind of Christ. Only then. And you have the mind of Christ. Yes, we've been regenerated. We are a new man in Christ. We've been born again. But it's only when I am agreeing with Scripture. And that's really what this conference is about. Aligning, very good word. Aligning our thoughts, our perspectives, our beliefs with God's. And the only way to do that is by agreeing with Scripture. It's just that simple. So look at verse 4. And Avram went just as the Lord spoke to him. And he went with him was Lot. Avraham was how old? 75 years of age. Now, numbers, they are important in the scripture, especially that number 75. If you read Acts chapter 7, Stephanos, that's Stephen, will tell you about 75 people that went down to Egypt. Let me ask you a question. What caused them to go to Egypt? Sin. It was their disobedience. You know what they hated? They hated the fact that Joseph had dreams. They hated that. They wanted to kill him. They ended up, of course, still selling him into slavery. And then what did they say? We'll see what happens to what? Those dreams. They hated the dreams of Joseph. Who, who gave Joseph these dreams? God did. They are revelation, and here's the problem. Most of the time, you and I, there's no difference between us. We really don't like God's revelation. We, we don't like God's instructions. We don't like what God's saying. What do we do? Well, prayer, biblically, that word for prayer in Hebrew is reflexive. What does that speak about? You say things, and then... God says things. It's, it's a back and forth. The Hebrew word for prayer involves a conversation. But, but I would suggest that most of us make our prayer time as kind of a monologue, is it not? Where we give God the list of things that we want him to do, and then we say, thank you, God, in Jesus' name, and we're done. We're, we're... God never, we never give God the opportunity to communicate. To, we're not listening to him. That's not prayer. Prayer is conversation. And the problem is we're not wanting God's revelation. 
We're not even open to it. And this is the problem. When we look at Avram with Lot, he was 75 years of age. In Acts 7, Stephen said 75 people went down to Egypt. 75. Why? Why did they go down to Egypt? For the purpose of what? Well, let me give you a term. The exodus from Egypt. Pretty important, right? What is that? Well, let me give you another term. Passover. What is Passover? The festival of redemption. God looked at the people, the descendants of Abraham, and he saw that they were not thinking properly. They weren't exercising faith, that faith that Hophram had. So God says they are rejecting truth. They are in sin. They are committing sin. They need a change, don't we all? They need to experience redemption. So he brought them to Egypt for the purpose of redeeming them. Where does 75 appear in the Bible? 75 people went down to Egypt. Where else? Have you ever read the genealogy of Christ in Luke's gospel? Pretty good genealogy, wouldn't you agree? And it says, it begins this way. Yeshua was approximately how old? 30 years of age. You think that's just a coincidence? 30 relates to death. You say, where's that taught in the Bible? Well, when Miriam died in the wilderness, the children of Israel mourned her for how long? 30 days. Aaron, her brother, died. And the children of Israel mourned Aaron for how long? 30 days. When Judas betrayed Yeshua and, and sold him over to be put to death, he got what? 30 pieces of silver. You seen something consistent? Relates to death. Now, what we're told in the New Testament is that Yeshua was approximately 30 years of age when he began his ministry. Now we know something. What was his ministry? To die. And then when we look from Yeshua unto that, that genealogy goes, begins with him and ends with who? God. It has to do with the son, father. God the Father and Yeshua, His only begotten Son. And if you count, I would encourage you to do it. Never believe what someone says. We can be holding a Bible. Don't believe. Check it out. Verify. And if you count all those names between Yeshua and God, how many names do you think there are? 75 names. Exactly. Why? Well, if you look, for example, in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 12, there's a surprise. Because we're told in Revelation, we're told in Daniel, there's going to be a times, times, and a half time. That's three and a half years, 42 months, 1,260 days. But when we look in Daniel, there's an additional 75 days. You think that's just coincidence? No, nothing is coincidental in the Bible. 75 relates to redemption. And God says in, in Daniel chapter 12, verse 12, blessed. It's the Hebrew word ashrei. Now, it's usually translated blessed, but it's also a word, if I say the word osher, it means an unbelievable happiness. You can only be blessed and unbelievably happy if you've been redeemed. There's no other way. And what God is telling us with the number 75 is he is going to bring about the outcome of redemption. So when Abraham was 75 years of age, it's saying that God is making this covenant. And this covenant that Abraham is responding to relates to redemption. What an important word. Remember that. We'll talk more about redemption later on. Now, for the sake of time. I want you to drop down to verse, well, the next verse, verse 5 at the end, where it says, Abraham took his wife, Sarah, and Lot, the son of his brother, 
and all that he had acquired, meaning all of his possessions, their possessions, which they had acquired. And what else did he take? What does your Bible say? All the what? Peoples. Some say servants. And some, I believe the King James gets it almost right. They say the word souls. Here's the problem. The word souls is nefashot. It's plural. Souls. This isn't plural. It is the word nefesh. And it is with the definite article, the soul, and keep reading what it literally says, the soul which they had made in Haran. That means something totally different. This is a problem when people want to translate, not based upon what it literally says, but what makes sense to us. Oh, Avraham and Lot and Sarah, they went with all their possessions and all their servants. That just makes sense to me. It doesn't say that. It says that God did something to Avraham and his family and even Lot. They had a spiritual change. Their soul was different. God worked in their life. That's what God does. God changes our soul, meaning we go through a spiritual transformation. And then we see that they go, and where did they arrive to? It says they come to the place all the way to Shechem, that's Shechem, unto another place alone, Moreh. Does that place mean anything to you? This is where it's mentioned in that battle that Gideon fought against the enemy. It's a battle of victory that took place. You may not know this, but it took place on a specific day. The day of first fruits. You know what's unique about that day? Read 1 Corinthians 15 because Messiah rose from the dead on that day. That day, that first fruit, is a day of victory. When we read that location, God is saying this covenant, when you respond to my covenantal instructions, I am going to work in your life to give you victory. When you do not submit to God's covenantal instructions, you are choosing, it's not God's will, but you are choosing Defeat in your life. God says it this way. I challenge you today. I put before you both life and death. Choose what? Life. But you can choose death. I set before you blessing and curse. I want you to choose blessing, but you can choose curse. But Abraham didn't. Abraham, he went to the place of victory, even though it tells us. Look at the end of verse 6. Even though, who was in the land? The Canaanites. And their name has to do with submitting. What was their problem? They didn't want to what? Submit. There was one woman, remember this. There was one woman and only one woman who was a Canaanite that submitted. Who was that? Rahab. Very good. Rahab. And her name genealogy in Matthew's gospel. That's the type of God that he is. He's a Canaanite. Ruth is there, a Moabite. It doesn't make any difference. Because these individuals, they submitted. Ruth said, your people are my people. That's a change. Your God is my God. That's a change. God brings change. So the Canaanites were there. And the Lord appeared to Avraham and spoke to your offspring. It's singular. Spoke to your offspring, your seed, not seeds, not descendants. It's singular. And he says, shouldn't surprise us, he says, I will give this land. Now, that is the second time he says, I'm going to bring you to a land. Now he says, I'm going to give you this land. Not just any land. 
but this specific land. That land is inherently tied, inherently connected to the promise. What promise? The promise of blessing. The promise of the kingdom. That shouldn't surprise us. Because Israel ceased to be during what captivity? The Babylonian. But God, in his perfect timing, brought the people back to the land. Why? Why? In order for Messiah to be born. That's why. In order to tell us that in case we didn't know that, there were those wise men from the east. When we say the east, that means Babylon to a Jew. The east, Babylon. It reminds us, yes, God's faithful. God's got covenantal obligations that he always, always, always fulfills. And he brought the people back from Babylon so that Messiah can be born the first time. And he was. And then we know in our days, we're living in biblical times. I want to say that again? We are alive in biblical times. And you can, and it's not that I like pick, well, I, I should be honest. I do like picking on people, but that's not my, my motivation right now. There is someone, his name is N.T. Wright. How many have heard of him? Now, he will say to you, and there's a video about Zionism that he spoke of, so you can find that video on YouTube and see what he says. But he will tell you that the promises of God are only found in Christ. I agree with him on that. I agree with him. But this is what he forgets. God's faithful. He is going to bring a remnant of the Jewish people to faith in Christ. Correct? The prophets tell us he's going to do that. It's got to happen for the kingdom to come. But what N.T. Wright says is this. Everything that goes on with the modern day of Israel, the fact that Israel is a modern day nation, and the people are coming back to land, he says, God's not part of that. That's just man. That's just the stubborn Jews being stubborn. That's what he says. It's not. God is at work. And why is he bringing the people back to the land? Not just any land. Why is he doing it? Because just like Messiah came the first time, he's going to come again. God is at work in our days. And he's working in a way that shouldn't surprise us. He's working to establish his covenant. Look, if you would, to verse 7, he says, and I will give this land. And what does that bring about? What did, what did Avram do? He built an altar. It initiated Avraham in a unique way, worshiping God. God's covenantal promises being fulfilled brings about worship. Look at verse 8. We're going to be done in just a minute. Now, John, he said that I tend to go on and on, and I'm not going to do that today. I'm not. I'm looking, it's 11 o'clock, and we got a little bit late start, but being the nice guy that I am, I'm going to shorten this in order that we can get close to schedule. We're going to stay on schedule today, because you challenged me, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do that. It says here, Vi Yatek. Now, I think most of your Bibles will say here again, the translators did not deal with the word. They dealt with what they thought made sense, what they thought was rational. Most Bibles does it not say that, that Abraham moved or he traveled, something along those lines. But the problem is this. When I look at this word, and by the way, it's in the Hebrew hithil, which is the causative one. When we look at that word today, for example, you have a document and you need a copy of it. Latek. You have to copy it. This is what the word is saying. That Avraham copied something. Doesn't mean that he moved, although he did. Doesn't mean that he traveled, although he did. Avraham copied, meaning this. 
What is he receiving in this passage? God is doing what? Speaking to him. And my experience is this. When, when, when God speaks to an individual, more often than not, God gives commands. Would you not agree? Just look in the Bible. The Bible, both Old and New Testament, are full of commands. Yes, there's historical events. Yes, there's miraculous events. But we find when God speaks, he commands. And what this verse is saying is this, that what God commanded Avram to do, he copied it. He implemented it perfectly into his life. Now, if the author wanted to say that he traveled, look if you would look at verse 9. There we have that word, the word linsoa, meaning to travel, to go from one location to another. That's not what chapter 12 and verse 8 is emphasizing. That passage is emphasizing Avraham's perfect submissiveness to copy the instructions of God in his life. And that's what we're called to do. Just that simple. You will never, and I say this a lot because it's so important, you will never regret agreeing with God. Never. But you will always regret disagreeing with him. When God gives us instructions, when we learn a principle in the Bible, copy it. Do it exactly. And you're going to see that God will move you forward. And God will instruct you in a greater way. He will change your perspective. I don't know about you, but I need to see things differently. When I see things naturally, I get in trouble. But when God gives me his supernatural perspective, how he sees something, and I see it, then I'm able to respond. I'm able to make wise decisions. What's wise decision? Agreeing with God, implementing his truth. Well, what we're going to do is that we're going to conclude this first session. We're going to have some refreshments. We thank Hillary. God, God is a miracle God. Hillary destroyed, she killed a coffee pot yesterday, did you not? And God miraculously has resurrected it for us today. That's God. So God is good. We're going to have some refreshments, and then we're going to come back. And we're going to see what the Apostle Paul reveals to us about God. How God is going to work in the last days and what we should be expecting. See, the problem is this. All too often, what we, the church, expects, we expect what we want. Don't do that. Expect what God has promised. Expect what God has instructed. His instructions are perfect. God's plans are much better for your life than your plans. Believe that. And implement His word. When we do so, we have the right expectations then we have the privilege, and I'll close with this. We have the great privilege of participating with God. Isn't this great? This holy, all-powerful, all-knowing God allows you and me to participate with him in doing great things. Everything God does is great. And I can do great things, but only with him. And that's what redemption allows me, unholy, to be with God. God is good. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for scripture. And may we be diligent to study, to show ourselves approved by knowing your word, keeping your word, implementing your word in our life. For this is our identity in Messiah Jesus. Amen.